If Ice Age people were sent by anything, it was the push and pull of the climate, the drive of human curiosity, and the tidal movement of other animals within which the people flowed. I doubt they would have considered themselves colonists, or that they had any idea of the scale of emptiness that lay ahead. During the Ice Age, Alaska belonged to the Old World. While ice sheets formed a barrier across much of Canada, the Bering Sea was dry. One could walk from Siberia to Alaska, and this is, without a doubt, the first stop Ice Age humans took on their way to colonizing all of North and South America. Called Beringia, this vast, conjoined land was a whole subcontinent, and more than just a stopping point on the journey to the New World. It was a destination itself, with thousands of years of prehistory that we have barely begun to study. Despite decades of research, Beringian archaeology remains poorly understood. Small modern populations, very few archaeologists, high costs of conducting research, and low levels of development make this area difficult to work in. Deeply buried sites, often occurring in frozen contexts and hidden under thick boreal forest and tundra, are complicated to discover and reach. I conducted archaeological survey this summer along the Yukon River in eastern Alaska, which required travel by small plane, two helicopters, and being ferried around by boat. Back in the Ice Age, the region looked quite different. Like much of Eurasia, which it was connected to, Beringia was dominated by mammoth steppe, vast arid grasslands filled with a menagerie of large mammals, like a subarctic Serengeti. In the mammoth ecosystem, the collective behavior of millions of competitive herbivores maintained the grasslands. In the winter, the animals ate the grasses that grew the previous summer. All the while, they fueled plant productivity by fertilizing the soil with their manure, and they trampled down moss and shrubs, preventing these plants from gaining a foothold. This rich, biologically productive, planet-cooling biome took up most of the high latitudes of the northern hemisphere. Dotted with muskox, mammoth, bears, both modern and extinct, and many other species. The aridity of the Beringian mammoth steppe is clearly visible in the layers of fine Pleistocene sands, kicked up by winds which settled beneath many of the sites of the Alaskan interior. Counterintuitively, southern Alaska was largely glaciated, while the interior may have offered a more livable environment. We have a few sites dating to around 30,000 years ago and several dozen dating to the very tail end of the Ice Age, say, 10 to 14,000 years ago. I'd like to introduce you to a few of these, and make a prediction about one way we might discover more sites in the years to come. In Siberia, the site of Nepo-1, located along the Nizhnaya Tunguska River, gives us a small flicker of human life that dates to at least 30,000 years ago. But this site has only yielded a small assemblage of stone artifacts, and the associated remains of a few large mammals. The Yana Rhino Horn site is a bit more exciting. Located along the lower Yana River, it contains a well-preserved cultural lair, with numerous stone and bone artifacts, including a projectile foreshaft carved from the horn of a woolly rhino. The Yana site has revealed awls made from bone and mammoth ivory, beads, needles, and traces of a long-term settlement. There's evidence for hunting of bison, mammoth, reindeer, horse, hare, muskox, fox, wolverine, brown bear, and many more species. There are reindeer tooth pendants and jewelry made from carved amber. It's an amazing sight. But the strange thing is, after the first smattering of sites around 30,000 years ago, we have a huge gap in the archaeological record. Bluefish Caves, located in Canada's Yukon Territory, dates to between 18 and 24,000 years old. But this is based solely on cut-marked bones, and flaked bones found without any other obviously man-made artifacts. Archaeologists still debate whether there could have been natural causes for these patterns. Some have proposed that as conditions worsened around the last glacial maximum, around 20,000 years ago, people were no longer able to inhabit the area. Others say we just haven't looked hard enough yet. The next sign of human life in Beringia occurs 14.4 thousand years ago at Swan Point. Swan Point is a high promontory along the Tanana River Valley, in the Alaskan interior where people camped, hunted, and scavenged along a major transportation corridor. The Tanana River Valley and nearby Ninana River Valley are actually hot spots for early Ice Age sites, and across Alaska, more than 30 sites date to earlier than 10,000 years old. 
with some notable examples including Broken Mammoth, Upward Sun River, Lime Hills Cave, and Tulawak Hill, to name a few. Like the continental US, Ice Age Alaska appears to have had a fluted point tradition, dating to at least 12,000 years ago, based on evidence from Serpentine Hot Springs and Raven Bluff. In Siberia, teardrop-shaped points from Berelek and Ushki Layer 7 date to as early as 13.5 thousand years ago. Microblades represent an interesting technological departure from what we see south of the ice sheets. At Lime Hills Cave in southwest Alaska, fragments of grooved antler points dated to 10 to 12 thousand years ago were likely inset with numerous tiny blades, almost like teeth. At Swan Point, microblades occur in deposits dating to 14 thousand years ago. In fact, there's good evidence for the widespread use of this technology across Ice Age Alaska. Only two Beringian burial sites are currently known, including one in Siberia and one in Alaska. The Siberian burials come from a site called Ushki-1 in Kamchatka. Ushki actually contains several burials. There's a single adult laid within a rock-lined pit. Filled with ochre, the pit included stone beads and stone tools. There are also two children buried in small pits within separate houses, and a dog burial inside another house. On the other side of the Bering Sea, in Alaska, Upward Sun River contains a child about three years old, cremated and buried in a pit hearth within a house. Below the child was another burial, containing two infants, four antler rods, and two bifacial points. These burials help humanize Beringian peoples, reminding us that they lost loved ones and laid them carefully to rest, often within their homes. Art can also help add a little human color to an otherwise dry, analytical story, but again, very little has been found. For instance, personal adornments like beads and pendants have not been found in Alaska, though in Siberia they've been found at Yana, as well as Ushki. I'd argue the most likely explanation for this dearth of art is simply the tiny sample of sites we have available. As we find more, I think more art will turn up. Let me suggest one way I think researchers might find more sites. Caves provide a disproportionate share of the earliest archaeological sites around the world. This is probably due both to how well they preserve ancient sediments, as well as their ritual and practical value to Paleolithic humans. Well, Alaska actually has a good bit of limestone deposits in which caves could have formed, including in sections of the interior which remained unglaciated during the last ice age. I made this map to show you what I mean. Blue is ice, orange is unglaciated limestone deposits. Most of these areas are likely to be poorly surveyed or completely unsurveyed. But if there are caves, they would have been accessible to the people of Beringia. Rather than marching through boreal forests and checking the occasional cut bank or promontory, I suspect surveying for caves may be one of our best bets for finding traces of Beringia. Let me describe one site. Quite ancient, but still early Holocene, not late Pleistocene. On Your Knees Cave on Prince of Wales Island in southeast Alaska provides one of the most fascinating early sites along the northwest coast. It dates to about 10,000 years old, and contains the remains of a man in his mid-twenties, whose remains lie scattered among a deep palimpsest of animal bones. The cave also contains stone tools made of obsidian, hinting at the trade connections and mobility of the people who lived along the coastline. We also learned that this individual was a specialist in marine resources, based on isotopic signatures in his teeth. While much of southern Alaska was uninhabitable, many argue for the presence of a habitable kelp highway, a belt of productive marine resources that would have allowed Ice Age people to hug the coastline, skirting the crushing ice that stared down from the mountains above. Maybe we need to find a site like Cosquet Cave in France, where divers found a submerged cave site filled with Ice Age art inundated by rising sea levels when the earth warmed up. My hope is that we'll find On Your Knees Cave's big brother. Just a little older, and we're in the world of the Ice Age. I'm also certain that another Swan Point or Broken Mammoth is just around the corner. Beringian archaeology is still in its infancy, and if we're lucky, we might get to see some of its greatest developments within our lifetime. <laughs>